foundations on which our empire rests are the workshops of democracy. In them are forged the links in the chain of industry which binds together our widespread empire. The hiss of molten metal, the shattering echo of the steel mills, the roar of the machine shops, all these are the marching songs of industry producing equipment for the development and protection of our empire. Under the stress of war, scientific research is turned to the creation of new ideas and inventions. Brilliant in conception, many of these embody the efforts of the finest British technicians and instill a feeling of pride and confidence in those who use them. Among the weapons designed for war on land, the British tank is predominant, and of these, the Crusader is outstanding. One of the latest products of engineering skill, it is a formidable addition to the equipment of the British forces. Armed with one high-velocity two-pounder gun and two machine guns, it is driven by an exterior track carried on no fewer than ten independently sprung bogey wheels. This gives even weight distribution, and more important, steady riding over rough ground, thereby promoting accurate gun laying. A wireless installation enables the commander to transmit or receive messages at full speed. The height of the Crusader has been kept down so that it will present as small a target as possible. This reduction in height also gives a low center of gravity, with a consequent increase in stability. The hull of the Crusader is divided into five separate compartments. On the right, in front, is the driver's compartment, while next to it is the auxiliary gun turret. Across the centre is the fighting compartment, which carries on its top the main turret. Immediately behind this is located the engine, while across the rear end is situated the transmission compartment, housing the steering mechanism and main drives to the track. Now let's go inside. In front, on the right, is the driver's compartment, and it is important that you should be conversant with the layout and familiarise yourselves with the controls and instruments. The pedal layout is quite normal, with the clutch on the left, the brake in the centre, the accelerator on the right, and the gear change lever between the driver's legs. On each side, in a natural and comfortable position, are the operating levers of the steering valves. The parking brake ratchet is controlled by a knob on the switch panel. The slow running control is to be found by the driver's right foot. As indicated by the arrow, at the right hand side of the driver's seat are the ignition and choke controls. As for instruments, an indirectly illuminated panel is mounted on the left side of the driver's hood. It comprises an air pressure gauge, engine revolution counter and oil pressure gauge. The combined speed and mileage recorder for the use of the tank commander is mounted on the rear bulkhead of the fighting compartment. The switchboard is situated immediately in front of the driver and on it are mounted on the left side the exterior light switches and the starter button while on the right side is the compass illuminant switch and the two ignition switches. An extra socket for an external inspection lamp is fitted beside the rear lamp under the louvers at the back of the vehicle. The driver is given a clear vision forward by means of a prismatic visor. Prisms that are damaged can be replaced quickly and in the event of an emergency the visor can be closed by means of a small lever which raises a bulletproof shield over the outer aperture. Vision is then obtained through fine slots in the front plate. Observation from the side is obtained through a slot which is covered by a shutter, operated by an accessible handle. So much for the driver's compartment. On the left-hand side of the front compartment is the auxiliary turret. This is mounted on a ball race, and the gunner's seat is suspended from it. By means of a spur gear type of hand travers, the turret and seat can be rotated through a total angle of 150 degrees. To prevent interference between the two-pounder gun and the auxiliary machine gun, the latter is automatically depressed by a cam in the main turret. Make quite sure that the travelling lock on the gun mounting is released, that is, in the up position, before the main turret is rotated. Otherwise, the depression control will be damaged. 
In the rear of the auxiliary turret is the fuse box for the driving lights, horn, inspection lamp sockets, etc. In the centre of the tank is the fighting compartment, which carries on its top plate the rotating turret. This is very heavily armoured and is designed to reduce the chances of a direct hit. Inside the turret are mounted the two-pounder and the 7.9 Beza guns. They and their telescopic sight are carried in a coaxial mounting at the side of which is a smoke bomb thrower. There are two periscopes, one for the commander, which is mounted centrally and is capable of rotating in any direction, and one for the loader, situated on the right side of the two-pounder. On either side of the turret is a large visor with a controllable bulletproof shutter. Access to the turret is by a large door in the roof controlled by parallel motion levers. The complete turret assembly is carried on a caged ball race and is operated by hydraulic traversing gear. It is controlled by the gunner and the speed of rotation can be varied, thus permitting both rapid and accurate gun laying. Also in the fighting compartment is the electrical control board, which is a complete unit housing the dynamo fuse, terminals for cable connections and an amateur. A strip-type fuse, for which spares are carried inside the terminal cover, will blow in the event of a dead short across the battery. Fuses are replaced easily by pulling and turning the Bakelite knobs at the top of the fuse posts. There is also a master switch which disconnects the battery from the remainder of the electrical equipment, thus providing a quick means of combating a short circuit. One of the most important features is a compressed air system, without which the vehicle cannot be moved. The air is drawn through a large capacity filter where it is cleaned, then through an anti-freezer unit. It is now compressed in the main component of the system and is then passed through an oil and water trap. The dry air is finally stored at about 220 to 230 pounds pressure in a storage bottle in the front of the fighting section. Across the rear of the vehicle is a transmission compartment. This contains a four-speed gearbox and steering units, the output shafts of the latter connecting to the final reduction gear and track driving sprockets. A powerful external contracting brake is situated on each side of the hull and operates on a brake drum mounted on the final drive pinion shaft. Immediately behind the main turret is the engine compartment. The power unit has 12 cylinders in two inclined banks of six. It is water-cooled, develops 340 horsepower at 1550 revolutions per minute and imparts a governed speed of 27.5 miles per hour to the tank. It has a high power-to-weight ratio, which is responsible for the extremely good acceleration and general performance of the Crusader. Remember that however good the design of a vehicle, such as the Crusader tank undoubtedly is, it is still dependent on human attention for the maintenance of its mechanical efficiency. For this reason, the crew should make themselves fully conversant with the maintenance duties and carry them out with conscientiousness and regularity, thereby ensuring that the fighting vehicle under their control is utilized to its greatest advantage. Remember, lubrication and mechanical adjustment are the stepping stones to mechanical efficiency.